Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. The 19th of May, 1780, was a remarkably dark day. Candles were lighted in many houses. The birds were silent and disappeared, and the fowls retired to roost. A very general opinion prevailed that the day of judgment was at hand. The end was coming, and God had lowered His hand over the people of New England for their wickedness. Or at least that's what a lot of religious zealots believed in the spring of 1780. The American colonies were embroiled in a war with England. Murder was rampant and rebellion was in the air. It seemed that the people of America were doomed. But what really happened that day? We don't know for sure, even well over two centuries later. One thing we do know, it was not the end of the world when the sky went completely black. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. In the days leading up to May 19, 1780, residents in New England were feeling relieved that winter was finally over. Spring had brought mild temperatures, which were wonderful after a particularly hard, cold winter. The most hard, difficult winter that was ever known by any living person. There was deep snow and severe cold with widespread suffering from all points north to Maine, southeast to Georgia west to Detroit and south to New Orleans. The harbors in Boston and New York had frozen over solid. Travel ceased, social interaction was non-existent, and shipping was halted. When the land began to finally thaw in early March, many bridges were damaged by the ice flows, but people were so happy to have warmer weather that they hardly cared. And then in May came New England's dark day. In the days leading up to it, residents in many parts of New England had noticed that the sky was cloudy and murky at dawn. The sun had a pinkish hue to it at midday and offered up spectacular copper sunsets. In Weston, Massachusetts, Samuel Phillips Savage remarked that there was a remarkable thick air and that the sunrises and sets were very red the evening's moon also gave off a pink reflection. Just a little past nine on the morning of May 19th, Reverend Thomas Savage noted that there came on an appearance over the whole visible heavens, a light, brassy hue, nearly the color of pale cider. By 10 a.m., the sky had turned dark. Crickets began chirping and cows returned to their stalls. A preternatural night had fallen. All over New England, every farmer, schoolboy, fisherman, young woman, blacksmith, clergyman, and laborer gazed upward 
for the missing sun and gasped at the remarkable and sudden elimination of all light. A deep shadow had fallen and everything bore the appearance and gloom of night. Noonday meals were served by candlelight. The newspaper, known as the Massachusetts Spy, reported that one could scarcely see to read common print, and it was the judgment of many that at about 12 o'clock the daylight was not greater, if so great, as that of bright moonlight, and no object was discernible but by the help of some artificial light. Samuel Savage of Weston could not even read his watch, even as he stood by his window. His neighbor was forced to quit spreading manure in his field as he was no longer able to discern the difference between the ground and the dung. At Sudbury, Massachusetts, experienced Richardson remarked that it was so terribly dark that we could not see our hand before us. In Connecticut, the legislature adjourned after looking out the chamber windows and then hurried home to their families. The members of the Council of Safety lobbied Senator Abraham Davenport to do the same, as the Day of Judgment may very well be at hand, but he reportedly and very wittingly said, the Day of Judgment is either approaching or it is not. If it is not, there is no cause of an adjournment. If it is, I choose to be found doing my duty. I wish, therefore, that candles may be brought." Lawyer William Pynchon of Salem, Massachusetts, recorded that most people scurried about with melancholy and fear. Everyone, that is, except for the sailors, who went hallooing and frolicking throughout the streets and shouted lewd remarks at women as they drunkenly tried to entice them to remove their clothing. Religious zealots clutched their Bibles, sure that doom was coming. A number of biblical passages referred to sudden darkness and attributed it to divine retribution and the Lord's Day of Judgment. Most then thought that the Second Coming was at hand and that surely the end was nigh. Needless to say, they rushed to the churches to repent. Many clergymen noticed that their pews were full and one reverend even retorted to a question posed to him about the gloom's origin that he was in the dark about the matter just as you are. Some writers claimed that there was a sulfurous odor in the air. Many other accounts pouring in from all over New England indicated a whiff of burnt leaves and smoke. Many birds were found dead on the ground, having blindly flown into structures or possibly asphyxiated by a thick smoke pall. By the next morning, things got back to normal and the sun returned as its effervescent self, and it occupied its right place in the sky. New England's dark day was over. It came and it went. But what caused it? After all this time, it remains a mystery. But we know that it was not a lunar or solar eclipse. For one, a lunar eclipse during the day does not bring darkness to Earth, there was an annual solar eclipse on May 4, 1780, but the only place that it made things go completely dark was southwest of Africa in the extreme southern Atlantic Ocean, a long way from New England, and it only lasts for about a minute and a half. Besides that, American colonists were familiar with solar eclipses. They'd seen them on August 5, 1776, January 9, 1777, and June 24, 1778, and no one thought the world was coming to an end. The last one had even been predicted by Benjamin Franklin in Poor Richard's Almanac. It should also be noted that a few months after the dark day on October 27, 1780, a scientific expedition of four professors and six students funded by Harvard College foundered in the woods of Maine near Penobscot Bay as they had hoped to glimpse a total solar eclipse. Unfortunately, they missed it. Reverend Professor Williams had miscalculated the path of the eclipse and led the group to the wrong area. This was subsequently dubbed as the Lost Eclipse of 1780. The point is that the colonists, in addition to the scientists of the day, were aware of and could easily identify a solar eclipse could it have been caused by a dust storm? That is unlikely. In those days, 
there were no dust storms of a magnitude to cause the day to turn completely dark. In the past century, the worst of all American dust storms was a series of destructive storms that took place during the infamous Dust Bowl that scoured the Great Plains in the 1930s. Drought and the accompanying erosion compounded the Great Depression with famine as farms that lost their topsoil stopped producing crops and forced a migration westward by families who had lost their homes and wandered into California looking for work. More major dust storms struck North Dakota and rained dirt on Chicago, Buffalo, Boston, New York, and Washington, D.C. The winter of 1934 and 1935 even yielded a red snow in New England. The king of dust storms during the Dust Bowl was definitely Black Sunday, taking place on April 14, 1935. It was one of a few dozen black blizzards that took place in the American heartland during the 1930s. Residents east of the blow could not see more than five feet ahead of themselves. But no such storms occurred in 1780. There is no record of them from trappers, explorers, or Native Americans west of New England at the time. Others have suggested a volcanic eruption. But this is also unlikely. One of the most destructive volcanic eruptions in terms of voluminous ash emitted over a very short time period happened, oddly, only three years after this dark day and lasted for a period of eight months. On June 8, in 1783 in Iceland, a volcano began spewing ash mixed with noxious sulfur dioxide. The resulting devastation that killed plant life and livestock was compounded by dark, low-lying clouds. This haze caused many deaths across Western Europe and altered the Earth's climate over the next few years. Great Britain suffered through the sand summer of 1783 after the poisonous cloud drifted across Scandinavia, Prussia, and France. This volcanic dry fog kept ships at port as they were unable to navigate, choked many residents to death, severely inhibited crop growth, and inferred a blood-red sun and sky. During the years immediately following the eruption, the weather fluctuated wildly. Extreme weather birthed incredible hailstorms, severe winters, and, ironically, sweltering heat. As was the case during the dark day, this deadly haze and bizarre meteorology was attributed to divine retribution upon a sinful population and sparked cries of the end is nigh. The only American volcanic eruptions that took place near the year 1780 were in the late 18th century at Mount St. Helens and at the Lava Dome of Mount Hood. Again, Native Americans and pioneers have not come forward with any records or accounts that would indicate a blanketing ash plume that blew eastward from the Cascades or the Rockies toward New England. The most convincing cause for the dark day is a forest fire. In Sidney Purley's Historic Storms of New England, he notes that early in May of 1780 there were major forest fires along the shores of Lake Champlain, most likely triggered intentionally, only to rage out of control by accident. New settlements were being made in northern New Hampshire, and deforestation was usually carried out by axe blade and fire. During this period, New England was predominantly covered with forests. Fields for farming were the creations of the settlers and for all intents and purposes not native to the New England landscape. The land-clearing method was basic. These trees were deliberately cut halfway through at breast high in late autumn, and during the winter brisk winds would topple many of the half-cut trees. To take down the remaining trees, woodsmen would cut a tree down on the perimeter of the lot and allow it to topple against another to create a domino effect, with the momentum of one falling timber continuing on to the next falling tree until a whole lot would be piled high, in some cases over 20 feet deep. When the snow melted and the lumber dried, it was then torched in late April or early May. The remaining ash was used as a fertilizer for crops. In the spring of 1780, it is believed some of these fires burned out of control. 
Where were the fires that blanketed New England in smoke and darkness coming from? In Weir, New Hampshire, a six-inch deep soot was reported on the ground, indicating that it was close to the source. In Boston, on the afternoon of May 18th, the day prior to the dark day, a breeze sprang up and blew a gathering smoke to the south. The following day, the wind changed direction several times before blowing from the east in an onshore breeze that caused a heavy fog. That fog then collided with a front composed of the timber smog and rain clouds swept up from the southwest. Could this have been a rare occlusion of a major warm front that was woven with thick smoke moving from the southwest and then saturated and stalled by cooler, moist salt air moving from the east? Could it have caused a thick cloud layer to stall over New England for several hours and consequently blot out the sun? On the dark day, considerable rain fell in Maine as thunderstorms with vivid lightning moved across southern New Hampshire. Only a little rain fell on Massachusetts. This would explain why this meteorological anomaly occurred in New England and only on a single day. As the storm came together, the thick smoke front stalled it out, causing darkness, storms in one location and hardly any rain in another. There is no guarantee that this was the reason for the dark day, but one thing we do know is that in all of American history, it never happened again. This episode is dedicated to the men and women of our armed forces and first responders. Whether you are currently serving or have served in the past, you are appreciated. It is because of your courage and sacrifice that we enjoy the freedoms and liberties we hold dear. And I, for one, appreciate every single one of you for protecting what many of us take for granted. So thank you. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. After a couple of months of searching, we finally found a new place to live within the city of Vladivostok. We wanted to be near to both of our jobs and be in proximity to at least a few stores. Neither of us owned a car, so when we found an apartment flat near the city's trolley network, it seemed like the best of both worlds. The building was brand new, one of the high-rise apartment blocks under construction all over the city. As we were touring with the building manager, he took us through several flat layout options, including one bedroom, two bedroom, etc. There was no paint on the walls yet, just sheetrock with the random spatter of plaster covering screw holes here and there. We found a corner unit on the 10th floor with a view of a nearby park, and we completed all the necessary paperwork. Now we just had to work out the move-in schedule and wait for the apartment to be finished. I ended up staying in the city midweek at the same tiny hotel where we had been staying following our last move out. Ludya spent most of her time at Babushka's Daka in the country, taking the 45-minute train ride back and forth to her job. On the weekends, we'd meet up there and spend time together. It wasn't ideal, but it was temporary and we were making it work. The short fall season had come to a close and winter was already settling harshly across the coastline. 
Daytime temperatures dropped from a comfortable 15 degrees Celsius during the day to about 5 degrees, and it froze every night. We started to make plans for the long, complicated winter holidays, which are so uniquely Russian. The first of these being the Feast of St. Nicholas in early December. If I had to relate it to any American holiday, I'd say it's probably like Thanksgiving, mostly revolving around a large family meal. As the snows began to blanket the Primorsky territory, Ladya and I spent more and more time exploring the area around Babushka's village. The forest was absolutely breathtaking covered in snow, like something from a fairy tale. Massive groves of pine, deep greens mixed with sharp white snow. Picturesque icy ponds with random deer or red foxes wandering about as they've done since life evolved in that ancient place. One of the places both Ludya and I wanted to visit was the Dead Village, which several villagers had told us about. No one could remember the official name of the town, and it had been abandoned since about 1930. One villager told it was vacated due to a massive influenza outbreak. Another told us it was abandoned due to the risk of sinkholes, which threatened to swallow the entire village at any moment. Babushka didn't say much about it when we'd ask. It's dead, she would say. Would it make it less dead if you knew why? It was easy enough to locate. The two villages had once been sister towns. There was still the rough outline of a country road which connected both locations. Easiest access was actually by horseback, which was itself a new experience for me. Ludya drove while I sat behind her. The journey was a bit slow going in the light, fluffy snow, and we had to stop several times. Finally, around noon, we came to the remains of a checkpoint. These cookie-cutter checkpoints were classic to the early Soviet Union. They provided a sort of guard post and emergency stopping location in case travelers needed help along the road. They were painted bright blue and could hold a couple of Soviet police troops. Several of the old posts were still visible around other villages in the area, though they had been long abandoned. This one was a little more than an outline, as the ceiling had obviously collapsed decades ago, allowing the wooden skeleton to rot and fail. The village itself was a ghost. You could make out where roads had been once by the tree lines. There were a few twisted frames of what looked like horse-drawn wagons or farm equipment. After 90 years, there wasn't much left that hadn't been claimed by the trees or been blasted to dust by the harsh winters. The entire area was completely still, the only sound coming from the feet of our horse as we made our way through the frozen remains of the town. Around the corner from a massive live oak, we found a stone house. Unlike the other wooden structures, which had all but been reclaimed by the forest, this building stood mostly intact. The front-facing windows were lined in stained glass, which Ludya said meant it was most likely the country home of some aristocrat, probably repurposed after its former owner was arrested or shot in the revolution. We stopped, dismounted, and explored the exterior of the ruins. One of the outer walls had collapsed and gave us full access to the first floor. Looking upward, a flood of light filtered down through the rotted floorboards, nothing blocking it out as the roof was completely gone over the first room. The narrow rays of light played tricks in the shadows, making it look like the walls were moving, dancing as we passed by. As we walked through the main entry hall, Ludya took several steps up what remained of the stairwell and stopped. I was distracted looking at what appeared to be bullet holes in the plaster near the front door. Ludya called my name a few times before I finally heard her and passed back around to where she was standing. She was frozen in place, her foot actually hanging where it had stopped as she had prepared to step up. Her eyes were locked on a dark area just through a crooked doorway at the top of the stairs. Do you see it? she asked me in a whisper. See what? I asked her back. I stared up at the open doorway, straining my eyes to make out anything. 
but there was only blackness. There's someone standing there, looking at us. She motioned with her hand as she said it. Moving closer to Ludya, I took a position directly next to her, standing on the same step. Nothing. I took another step up. The wood of the stairs was spongy and giving way more than I liked. At about the fifth step, I stopped. I could see something. Perhaps what she was talking about. It had shape and it was roughly the size and outline of a man. The edges weren't clear so it was hard to make out an exact size or the dimensions. The form was a dark, smoky gray against the black of the hallway behind it. It definitely appeared to be watching us. Standing or floating or whatever you'd call it just at the top of the steps. I stood there dumbfounded. I had never seen anything like that before. My mind churned over the possibilities, but I was aware of a nagging fear as well. Something told me I should leave, but I couldn't turn my attention away. Ludya called out to the figure from behind me, asking who or what it was. The sound of her voice is what it took to snap me back from my transfixed stare. Backing down the stairs, I took her hand and directed her a few steps back toward our entry point. We should go, I said to her, and she agreed. Before we moved on, however, she raised her camera from its place around her neck and snapped a photo. The intense light from the flash shocked my eyes, and it took several seconds for them to recover. When they had, I returned my gaze to the stairwell. The figure was gone. We made our way back out of the ruins and to the horse. But the ride back, we couldn't stop talking about it. To this day, when I close my eyes and think back to it, I can picture things so clearly. Babushka, as usual, was not impressed when we told her what we saw. Desven Yagosti, she said to us, which meant even ghosts hate uninvited guests. Pedro Rodriguez Filo is one serious serial killer. He's responsible for at least 70 murders, 10 of which he committed before reaching the age of 18. When it comes to Pedro Rodriguez Filo, though, being a good guy can actually pay off. Filo targeted victims who, for the most part, weren't just average everyday people. Described by one analyst as the perfect psychopath, Philo went after other criminals and those who had wronged him. Philo's life started out rough from the moment he came into the world. He was born in 1954 in Minas Gerais, Brazil, with an injured skull as a result of a beating his mother took from his father while she was pregnant. Philo committed his first kill when he was only 14 years old. The victim was his town's vice mayor. The man had recently fired Philo's father, who was working as a school guard, for allegedly stealing food from the school. So Philo shot him in front of City Hall with a shotgun. His second murder wasn't long after. Philo went on to murder another guard, who was the supposed real food thief. He fled to the area of Mogi das Cruces in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Once there, Philo killed a drug dealer and participated in some burglaries as well. He also fell in love. Her name was Maria Olympia, and the two lived together until she was killed by gang members. Olympia's death spurred Philo's next crime spree. He tracked down several people related to her murder, torturing and killing them in his mission to find the gang member who took Olympia's life. The next notorious murder Pedro Rodriguez Philo committed was also one of vengeance. This time the target was his own father, the same man he committed his first murder on behalf of. Philo's father had used a machete to kill Philo's mother and was doing time at a local prison. Pedro Rodriguez visited his father in jail where he killed him by stabbing him 22 times. Then, taking things to a whole other level, Philo proceeded to cut out his father's heart 
before chewing on it. Philo was finally arrested on May 24, 1973. He was placed in a police car with two other criminals, including a rapist. When the police opened the car door, they discovered that Philo had killed the rapist. It was the start of a whole new chapter, being thrown in prison where he was surrounded by convicts. Well, that was Philo's bread and butter. Philo killed at least 47 of his fellow inmates, which made up a majority of his murders. It's reported that the convicts Philo killed while incarcerated were ones who he felt deserved retribution. He was interviewed saying that he got a thrill and joy out of killing other criminals. He also said that his favorite method of murder was by stabbing or hacking with blades. Though Philo was initially sentenced to 128 years in prison, the crimes he committed while he was in jail up to sentence to 400 years. But by Brazilian law, the maximum prison sentence is only 30 years. He served an additional four for the murders he carried out in prison. So in 2007, unbelievably, he was released. Pedro Rodriguez Filo is notorious in Brazil, not just for the many people he killed, but for promising the murder of other criminals. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. It's no secret that some places are dangerous to visit. Those who have no knowledge about one particular forest may think it is just a beautiful place in Clapham outside of Worthington, West Sussex, UK. However, those who have had the misfortune of visiting the woods will tell you otherwise. Witnesses have seen mysterious things there. Mysterious deaths, unexplained vanishings, and unusual sightings reveal this is by no means an ordinary place. This place has a very long, dark, and frightening history. An invisible and unknown force seems to have a terrifying effect on all living beings who visit the woods. Some horrifying sightings have made people insane. It has been suggested the place serves as a passage between our reality and the world beyond. Another possibility is much more frightening. It seems that something evil and sinister is lurking in the woods. What could it be? The small village of Clapham is located a few miles north of the town of Worthing, West Sussex, UK. Clapham is a typical English village that has existed since Saxon times. Under normal circumstances, there is no reason why the rest of the world should even be aware of Clapham. It's just one of many ordinary villages in the United Kingdom. However, numerous UFO sightings, mysterious deaths, and unexplained vanishings around Clapham have made this place famous. As soon as you approach the village and glance at an old oak standing alongside the road, you can feel the mysterious atmosphere that surrounds the village of Clapham Wood. Many people say curious events started to take place in this region about 60 years ago, but according to locals, 
there has always been something wrong with Clapham Wood. What it is, however, no one knows. If you dare to enter the woods, you can come across ruins of old, long-deserted houses. Some of the houses belonged to women who were executed as witches. There's also a certain area of soil where nothing grows. Some believe the reason why there is no vegetation there is because a World War I bomb destroyed the ground. Others suggest that the circular depression was caused by a meteorite. It's difficult to determine what exactly happened here a long time ago, but one thing is certain – the dark soil where no bushes, trees, green grass, or flowers ever grow does look somewhat creepy. During the 1960s, the area around Clapham became a hotspot for UFO activity, attracting many ufologists and researchers. Still, what appears to be one of the first UFO sightings in the region occurred several hundred years ago. One day, an old woman who lived in the woods told the other villagers that she had seen a shining round disk that resembled the full moon. The object was hovering over the woods. Later, it disappeared somewhere among the trees. A short while later, the area was filled with bad-smelling smoke. What happened to the shining, flying disk? Did it crash in the woods? There was no additional information about that case. The old woman died shortly after she told her story. Locals avoided her. Some people thought she was crazy while others considered her to be a witch. In more recent times, many people reported sightings of strange bright lights over Clapham Wood. Some claim that alien craft have even landed in the area. Unfortunately, people said that most sightings occurred at night and the UFOs were only visible for a brief moment. These circumstances make it extremely difficult to investigate witnesses' reports. Still, this does not prevent us from discussing some interesting UFO sightings that took place in Clapham. A late evening in October 1972, an engineer had just finished his night shift and was on his way home. He was alone in his car. When he reached Fondon Road, he suddenly spotted a large, saucer-shaped object over the trees. The unknown object was hovering for some minutes before it started to fly in circles. Then, within seconds, it vanished out of sight. Interestingly, several UFOs were observed in the skies over Clapham that same month. A married couple reported that they were walking along Long Furlong when they saw a bright object in the skies to the west. At first, they thought it must have been Jupiter or Venus, but the object began to move at a great speed, flying straight toward them. When the UFO was over Clapham Wood, it sent a vertical beam of light straight down, aiming at something on the ground. The beam was visible for about 10 seconds. Then, in a blink of an eye, the object vanished and left the area. Perhaps one of the most significant UFO observations was made by Paul Glover of the British Phenomenon Research Group. During the summer of 1967, Paul was taking a stroll together with a good friend, it was a calm, cloudless evening. As they walked, they admired stars which were visible this particular evening. Around 10 p.m., when both men were approaching Glapham Wood, they suddenly noticed an enormous dark mass in the night sky, not far above their heads. The mass was so large that Paul and his friend could no longer see the stars. The giant dark mass was moving very fast. When the object came closer, they could see it was boomerang-shaped. It made absolutely no noise, but when it passed them, the wind was so strong that Paul and his friend had to take cover in the bushes. Both men were convinced it could not have been a cloud. It was a solid, large, fast-flying object. When the dark mass was gone, the two somewhat shaken men continued their walk. Shortly later, they suddenly noticed two bright objects high in the sky. They were able to observe the two UFOs for several minutes. To their surprise, a small object emerged from one of the UFOs. It flew to the second bright shining craft. 
the smaller craft appeared to enter the other UFO. It was inside for a brief moment, then it came out again. It took off with remarkable speed and vanished completely out of sight. When Paul and his friend came to Clapham Wood one hour later, they witnessed yet another spectacular sight. Two yellow lights were visible above the wood. Some seconds later, two more lights appeared out of nowhere, followed by three more. There was a massive concentration of lights over the woods. This time, Paul and his friend were not observing any solid objects, but lights. The lights seemed to come from an unknown source inside the woods, somewhere among the trees. The lights kept appearing in pairs. They were very fast and all vanished in the night sky. The men looked around but could not detect any type of flying craft in the vicinity. Then the light show was over, the sky was dark and filled with stars again. What was the connection between the mysterious yellow lights and the huge, dark, boomerang-shaped mass observed by Paul and his friend just one hour earlier? Some have suggested there is an alien underground base deep inside Clapham Wood, and this is why UFOs are frequently sighted in the area, but no one knows the truth. Perhaps it is true. Those who believe in UFOs say it's very likely unknown craft are visiting Clapham Wood frequently. Some have suggested there could be other reasons luminous lights are attracted to this place, though. According to Mr. Bennett, a local priest, people in the village have always said the wood is extremely strange. Undoubtedly, there is something wrong with this place, but few can propose any other explanation as to what's happening around here. Due to the large number of credible witnesses, it's difficult to dismiss the bizarre sightings that have troubled the region for so many years. Even more puzzling, or rather horrifying, are the mysterious vanishings and deaths reported in this area. People and animals feel sick and behave strange when they find themselves near the woods. Many say an unusual mist is causing hallucinations and illusions. What kind of danger is lurking in the woods? Are we dealing with a supernatural phenomenon or is there a more down-to-earth explanation that could account for all the scary incidents that are happening there? Several animals have gone missing around Clapham Wood, and many pet owners say that their animals often behave strangely when they visit there. Well-trained dogs disobey orders and seem disoriented. Whatever is lurking in the woods is affecting different types of animals, not only dogs, but also cats, horses, and rabbits. People who visit Clapham Wood report that they've experienced feelings of nausea and discomfort while walking in the woods. Some people claim that they were suddenly being pushed around by an unseen force. Sometimes those who visited Clapham Wood encountered a strange gray mist that caused hallucinations and produced illusions. People say that the mist resolved itself into the shape of a bear or, in some cases, into a fox-like animal. Pain is often associated with the unseen force that is present in the woods. Two men who were walking in Clapham Wood reported that they both experienced severe pain at exactly the same time. One of the men suffered an incredible headache. In his statement, he said that he felt as if his head was going to explode. His friend, on the other hand, could barely walk because the pain in his stomach was so strong he was unable to stand on his feet. The pain they felt was indescribable. They helped each other to get away from this terrible place. Both men were desperate and they did all they could to escape the evil, invisible force. They were crawling on the ground, moving slowly forward. About 45 meters further away, both men suddenly noticed that the pain was gone. What kind of mysterious force can be affecting animals and people, causing nausea, pain, discomfort, and hallucinations? Researchers who have read independent reports and investigated many scary incidents that occurred in Clapham Wood are convinced that there is some form of energy force radiation or unknown power in the area. When this energy force or power is released, 
it ultimately affects all living beings who happen to be in its vicinity. Unfortunately, so far, despite many speculations, scientists have not succeeded in identifying this force. Strange vanishings and deaths are a part of Clapham Wood's dark history. Over a 10-year period, four mysterious deaths have occurred close to the woods. Due to the advanced state of decomposition of the bodies, it was very difficult to determine the cause of death. In June 1972, Peter Goldsmith, a 46-year-old police officer and Royal Marine officer, disappeared in Clapham Wood. He was an experienced rambler who was in excellent physical condition. He was last seen entering the wood carrying a large sport bag. Police and volunteers searched the woods, but it took six months before Mr. Goldsmith's body was finally found. He was hidden in a patch of thick bramble. Three years later, in August 1975, a couple was out in the woods looking for a lost horse. Accidentally, they discovered the body of Leon Foster, whose wife had reported him missing three weeks earlier. On All Hallows' Eve in 1978, Reverend Harry Neal Snelling, the retired vicar of Clapsham Parish, disappeared while returning home after a dental appointment. His body was found three years later by a Canadian tourist. In September 1981, Miss Gillian Matthews, a 37-year-old homeless woman, went missing. Her body was found six weeks later. She had been raped and strangled. People in the small village were scared. Everyone wondered who was responsible for all the murders in Clapham Wood. In 1987, Toyna Newton, Charles Walker, and Alan Brown published a book called The Demonic Connection. The authors maintained that Clapham Wood was being used for rituals by a satanic cult that called itself the Friends of Hecate. Hecate was a triple-headed goddess of the Greek underworld. Charles Walker, a council worker from Worthington who has been investigating Clapham for more than 20 years, is convinced that devil worshippers are responsible for the abduction of animals and deaths of missing people. There are people who oppose Mr. Walker's investigation, and he has been threatened on several occasions. Once a man pulled a pistol on him. On another occasion, he was involved in a hit-and-run incident. He was knocked off his bicycle by a speeding car. Naturally, all of this made Mr. Walker somewhat frightened. He decided not to pursue the cult's activities in Clapham Wood any longer. At least not for a while. Some years later, he met Toyna Newton, a researcher who had been investigating Clapham Wood for some time. Mr. Walker and Mr. Newton collaborated, compared their research, and finally published a book together. In October 1987, a great storm swept across South England and most of the countryside's landscape was devastated. Clapham Wood suffered extensive damage, and many think this was the reason why the devil worshippers finally left the area. According to Charles Walker, Clapham Wood was a normal and peaceful place in the late 1980s, but when Mr. Walker returned to the area ten years later, he found once again evidence of altars and strange fires. Obviously, the friends of Hecate had resumed their activities, and some think these evil people are most likely still present there today. The presence of a dark cult could shed light on some events happening in the woods, but it's still unknown why there have been so many UFO sightings in the area. What is the origin of the mysterious lights seen at night? Why do people feel sick in certain parts of the woods? What is the huge, dark mass that so many people have seen moving across the skies of Clapham? These are questions we still cannot answer, and these incidents require more investigation. Clapham Wood remains an unsolved mystery. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. 
If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.